Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's webinar, which is called New Approaches to Scholarly Publishing, Introducing F1000. Uh, my name is Simon Grimley. I'm one of two moderators for the event today. Uh, I work here at NAS as an advisor to the International Cooperation Department um, with a particular focus on our activities in Europe. And uh, I'd like to introduce my colleague, who's also a senior advisor to NASA, Ajahn Subapan Serafin, but she is connecting now, I believe. But we will, as soon as she's online, we will connect with her. Um, before getting started with the program, I just wanted to run through a few housekeeping issues. So Dr. Liz Allen, today's presenter, has kindly uh, offered to share her slides, her presentation slides, with all of today's participants, which is, which is great. So we'll do that after the event. We will also share with you a recording of today's webinar uh, to all those who, who joined this afternoon. And um, we, would, we would encourage you to ask questions. This is, this is really uh, a webinar we've set up for you. Um, so to make you better acquainted with some of the new initiatives in open science, open access. So please ask questions. Um, you can ask questions at any time during the during the webinar um, by just typing your question in the in the chat box on the right hand side of your screen. Uh, so, and we will do your best or do our best to answer all of your questions as we go along. Um, and if we don't get through all of your questions, you know, this afternoon, we'll we'll follow up with you uh, individually. So, so please do ask lots of questions. This is meant to be. Uh, it's not a lecture. It's a discussion. And um, please take full advantage of the fact that we have, we have F1000 uh, and Dr. Liz Allen with us today. So let me briefly introduce uh, Dr. Liz Allen and F1000. F1000 is, has been described as the world's first open research publishing platform. Um, and it, it is providing publishing solutions to a number of, of well-known uh, international research funders, including the Gates Foundation, Wellcome, and the European Commission. Uh, F1000 has been selected actually to be the, the, uh, the open research platform uh, for Horizon Europe, which many of you may have heard about. This is this very large EU research and innovation funding program that, that kicks off this year and will run until 2027. So we can talk in, in, in greater detail uh, about that during during the webinar. Um, let me introduce Dr. Liz Allen. She is the Director of Strategic Initiatives at F1000 um, and is involved in shaping new initiatives and partnerships in the area of open research publishing. Um, and prior to joining F1000, she was spent more than a decade working on the evaluation team at Wellcome, uh, which many of you I think will know. Um, Liz is also a visiting senior research fellow at, uh, at the Policy Institute at King's College London, um, and she is, has a particular interest in science policy and research-related indicators. She is also a cross-reference board director, co-founder of, 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 of an initiative called Credit, which is Contributor Roles Taxonomy, and serves on the advisory board of the Software Sustainability Institute. So Liz has, has both the research experience, the evaluation experience, and obviously the, the open research publishing experience. So we are very fortunate to have her with us today. And I'd now like to turn the floor over to Liz and, and, and uh, um, let her introduce um, current trends in open research and, and, and more specifically F1000. So Liz, over to you. Thank you, Simon. And thank you for NASDA for um, inviting me to uh, participate in this webinar and, and hopefully share some um, ideas and new thinking with you today. Um, as Simon mentioned, please ask any questions at all, uh, no matter how uh, either basic or complicated they are. We are really happy to hear what you think and if you have any suggestions and ideas. Um, 
uh, we're all very forward thinking with the way that scholarly publishing is working at the moment. So it, it's really important that we we all uh, do this together and, and we're really interested to hear a researcher and community feedback on everything that we do. So please just ask any questions. And as Simon mentioned, I'm also personally happy to follow up with any inquiries as well. I'll leave my email on the slide deck at the end, though you can filter any questions obviously through Simon and the team. Um, but I'm also available if people want to chat chat through things. So I'm going to share my slides. Can I just check you can hear me okay? The audio is okay? Perfect. Yeah, I'm I should say, I should say, Sawadika, I'm calling from London. So nice to uh, be part of this um, from that perspective also. It's, uh, it's early morning here or late morning here. Um, so I know it's later in the day for you. So can you tell me if you can see my screen? That looks great, Liv. That's great. OK, so I wanted to start, um, as, as Simon mentioned, uh, F1000 is part of a general trend in the way scholarly publishing is evolving. And it's part of a movement around using the words open research or open science. So I'm going to start with a little bit of context um, for those of you who are not familiar with um, the way uh, scholarly publishing is evolving and, and why. So as you, I'm sure you all know, uh, how research is being shared and discovered is changing very rapidly. Um, no sooner had I put this slide together, um, a number of new initiatives evolve, uh, providing researchers with tools and websites and publishing platforms and journals and preprint servers and all kinds of places for people to share aspects of their research, sometimes the full uh, research findings, but sometimes data or blogs or insights, and it's becoming much more complicated um, to, to find things, but also much more exciting. There are many more opportunities for people to find out about who and what research is being done and importantly, be able to use that research. You've probably heard of the term open science, so I've put it in inverted commas. But really what we're trying to do, the whole aim of open science is to make what we do in research more effective and do it well. And make sure that we're sharing and building on the research findings of, of, of our colleagues, of ourselves, uh, of others, of our competitors. Um, it's really important uh, for an efficient research system and there's much evidence to show this that research is available and usable and in formats uh, that people can understand and build upon. There's lots of definitions of open science as well. If you go onto the web and you do a Google search of what open science is, you get all kinds of definitions, but they all tend to round down on four main aspects of it, which are these pillars here. So perhaps the most basic one is this one here, open access. So providing the ability for your research to be viewed and accessed and, and looked at. So that's kind of the most basic pillar. But increasingly, as technology has moved on and allowed us to do this, we're increasingly seeing researchers being able to share their research data openly and open research code. So any research code or programs or methodologies really that are involved and, and underpin your research, the ability to share that kind of information. And then latterly, and it's becoming much more common um, in the last couple of years, is also having aspects of open peer review in the whole science endeavor. So these are the four pillars that are con consistently pulled out as the key things for enabling open science. And the other thing that's, that are happening, obviously, is technology is driving the ability to share and publish research in much diff more different ways, a bit like I showed you at the beginning with all the different tools and techniques. So obviously the role of machine learning and artificial intelligence in enabling us to discover and connect research is moving at a fast pace. There are new discovery ability tools emerging all the time to enable that those connections to be made and allow researchers to find information. We're becoming much cleverer across publishers particularly, but we're also seeing funding agencies using information consistently around uh, 
describing research, making sure that the uh, author's information or the researcher's information is described, making sure that, that any information research outputs have their own identifiers and trying to connect all these pieces of the research system together. That's becoming much more um, uh, developed and it's, it's, it's changing all the time. To support this, there are lots of new standards around how to publish research and making sure that when you publish research, everyone describes it in, in a great way that allows you to discover it and find it. And there are also lots of policies and mandates now coming from funding agencies, from research institutions, um, supporting researchers who want to make their work open access. But also from the institutions and the funders perspective, it's really helpful to have their research that they've funded or they've supported uh, available out there, uh, used, reused uh, to allow you know, their, their um, performance and, and uh, competitiveness and also profile. It just shows the importance of uh, research being supported by funders and institutions. Accompanying this, we're seeing a move across the world and it's different in different regions in the world. Uh, in how research is valued. There's quite a lot of moves, particularly in Europe and America at the moment, to make sure that all types of research output are valued for their own, own in their own right. And we don't just focus on work being published in the most highest impact journals, because there are many other outputs related to research that are really important and really help you be able to make the best of what research has been done. And one of the key trends, and again, this, this relates to what F1000 is doing, there's an increasing demand, again, uh, facilitated by technologies and the ability to do this, but there's much more demand for more rapid approaches to being able to share your research. Traditional publishing systems through publishing through journals can take quite a bit of time, and there are lots of processes and policies in place that uh, make, is important in that process, but it also um, sometimes adds time to the ability to share research. So there is a demand among researchers, among funding agencies and among publishers themselves to make research much more accessible and published quicker. As a key example of this, I suspect most of you have heard of uh, the concept of preprint publishing, so effectively publishing an early version of your research uh, out in the community in, a, in an open platform before it's been peer reviewed and uh, before it perhaps appears in a journal. And there's been a massive growth. This is a trend in biology related or biomedical sciences related preprint publishing over the years from 2013 to, to, to date. And you can see the massive trend in the last three years in particular from 2018. This is where um, BioArchive and MedArchive uh, came onto the scene. It's just, you just see a real increase in the ability um, and the demand from researchers to publish their work using rapid models. So I just wanted to present that context because that is effectively the context and the background and the reason why F1000 developed a publishing approach that we have uh, against the backdrop of wanting to publish research rapidly to produce research in ways that support the ability to use and reuse it and essentially to move us in, in the way to try and encourage more collaborative and open science that values all aspects of the research process. So we were launched as a company in 2013. The first thing that we did, we launched an online open access research publishing platform. We call it a platform. It effectively is a journal. Everything you publish in here is citable, it's indexed, um, it's treated as a journal article. We just went completely full digital, fully open, um, and lots of features in here, which I'll describe in a moment are designed to support the shift to open science to make sure that research is accessible, not just accessible that you can see it, so not just open access, but going beyond open access to make sure that the research is as usable as possible. As a company, uh, we were quite independent and kind of small um, until uh, we were acquired by the Taylor and Francis Group last year. Um, so now it, it's great to be part of the, a bigger organization that is really grabbing hold of this uh, concept of 
pushing the pushing the boundaries for uh, published research publishing and open research more generally. So we are now part of the Taylor and Francis group. And over the last four years, but particularly in the last year, we've we've been pushing this and uh, 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 accelerating the ability to do this. We're now offering end to end publishing solutions to a number of organizations. So I wanted to explain more about the publishing model. So we describe the publishing, as I mentioned, it's underpinned by a, a desire to support open science, to support the ability for you to publish your research, but much more allow people to access it, use it, reuse it. That's the key thing we're trying to do. So we designed the, the publishing model to support the whole research life cycle. So it's got features that support rapid publishing, it supports a diversity of publishing options. So we uh, provide uh, attractive features for researchers across all career stages. From researchers working in a diversity of roles, so they could methodologists, statisticians, um, qualitative researchers, researchers working in a, a whole range of research related professions. And we also support the publishing of outputs from all stages of the research cycle. Again, focusing on the publication of things like methodologies and your data uh, and also full blown research articles, but a whole range of different outputs from stages of research. Within the model, we also maximize the potential for the use of the and reuse of that work. So open access, as I mentioned, is key. We also inc include fair data policy. So we have a, I'll explain a little bit more about that, but we encourage the researchers who publish with us to make sure that their data are in a great shape for others to be able to use it, should it be, should it be required. And again, facilitated by the technology that we use, we're all about maximizing the discoverability of that research as well. So publish with us, we make sure that it's indexed, uh, available for long term, has licensing that allows it to be um, used in lots of different places and, and visibility for authors and the institutions and the funders that are associated with them. As Simon mentioned at the beginning, we're working with a, a lot of different types of organizations all of these organizations in working with us essentially are all supporters of the whole move to open science and they wanted to work with us to kind of support the processes and the approaches that we've developed but also support the people that they fund or they work with or they support to be able to access the services that we provide as well i'll explain um, what we do with um, those organizations a bit later, but you can see that we work with big funding agencies, particularly uh, such as the Gates Foundation, the Wellcome Trust and the European Commission. So anyone can publish on our F1000 research publishing platform. You have to meet some criteria, but any researchers, anybody on this call who's a researcher and has research findings that they want to share can publish with us. I'm just going to explain the basic publishing model because it is quite different and it's quite unique. And again, it has been designed to maximize discoverability, reach, use, and the potential impact of that research. So in short, somebody would submit a research piece to us. We do a series of checks on that, quite a, quite a substantial number of what we call pre-publication checks. So we check for plagiarism, we check for ethical approval, we check that any data or underpinning materials are available at the point of submission. Uh, and we check the author credentials and, and there are a number of other checks. If an article passes that and articles are rejected at this point, around 20 to 30% are rejected at this point because they don't have the information and the credentials to allow that work to be as used and reused as possible. But if they pass those checks, which we try to do in between 14 and 21 days. So it's pretty quick, those first rapid checks. They are published. If it passes, the work will be published on the site, indexed in Google Scholar immediately. It will be issued with a DOI and it's also available on the F1000 platform. And it will be available if it's published somewhere else, it will be published on their pl platforms too. I'll explain that in a moment. But it will be available for people to read before the peer review is done. 
So this is a post publication peer review model. So once we've done the credential checks on the row on the work, we will then put it onto the platform and it triggers the peer review process. Our peer review process is entirely transparent and this is one of the pillars as go back to the pillars of open science. We have integrated an open peer review module into our approach. So we invite a peer reviewer, so it's not open that anyone can peer review. They're invited peer reviewers based upon the kinds of uh, algorithms. We use a combination of algorithms, author suggestions, and we have an in-house team who help work with the authors to make sure who we invite to peer review have the right qualifications. We screen like any publisher for conflicts of interest, of course, um, but a peer reviewer is then invited to review the work. So at this point, the reviewer then posts comments. They're given two jobs. They have to write a narrative peer review, like with any other journal, and they also uh, allocate a status to the article of whether a whether they think it's in at a state that should be indexed more broadly than being available on the F1000 platform. So they post the comments and then sub subject to their comments, the author can then respond and provide another version. All versions are connected together, so the DOIs are linked. And once an article has reached a threshold that the peer reviewers um, say has passed peer review, the article is then also sent to all the indexes that we work with. So we work with PubMed, Scopus, DOAJ, and there are a number of other publishers, uh, sorry, indexes that we work with. So suddenly, once the article has passed peer review, it is much more discoverable and much more available. So we have a two stage process. And for those of you familiar with pre posting work on preprint servers, it effectively combines preprinting with um, the quality assurance that peer review it gives you. So it ties the two together, makes it a one stop shop process, um, but makes it really simple, really author driven uh, and a really great experience for authors in terms of getting it through the system quickly. Some of the core questions we get asked a lot, um, and I just wanted to put this in here is, what, what do we mean by data? When we say open data, and as I mentioned, F1000 has quite rigorous checks around the data and the underpinning materials being described in that research. What do we mean? So research can be in many different, research data can exist in many different ways. Uh, it can be quantitative or qualitative. It can be measured or perceived. It can be numerical or textual or other kinds of formats. And there are some examples there on the right hand side. So it can include things from field notes or case studies, um, could be very code based um, or genome sequencing. It could be derived from surveys or questionnaires. Open data, like open access, has many benefits. So the key thing, and this is why we why we include it and why it is a mandate for us, it enables the work to be used. Often we have, op if you provide open access to an article, so you can see the article and read it, that's great. That's a great step. And open access really took off at the beginning of the two, uh, the change of the uh, the new century. Um, but actually, the key thing really we always wanted to do was get hold of that research and be able to use it. So we, with open data and open code and other aspects of open, that takes open access to the real kind of nub of what we're trying to do with it in the first place. So it makes research usable. We know that a lot of research data gets lost. Um, and if it's not published and, and available alongside research analysis, there's a huge waste there. Uh, which also is key for supporting things like reproducibility, so people can check your data, uh, people can look at what you've done and build upon it. Um, and we know that that's a massive issue, the, the research waste in the system is a massive issue for uh, research funding agencies and institutions uh, in particular. There is evidence that open access and actually open data increases the ability for your work to be cited, because if you provide a more holistic view of your research, it's easier to, for others to use. So there's a real citation benefit there in terms of increasing your reach or your profiles. Also, as an example of, a, of an article there that shows that um, a study has shown that there's many studies that do show that now. And just to go back to 
you might have heard the term fair data. Uh, these are about making your data as findable, as accessible, as interoperable, and as reusable as possible. Another thing that we, we're really keen on supporting is providing the ability for research to be viewed and valued in many, many different ways. So everyone's familiar, I assume, on this call with the idea of being able to cite research, of course. That's a real great indicator that others are using your research, particularly in the research context. But it's also really interesting to look at how people are in different fields are talking about your research. Um, you know, in terms of the reach that it has, in terms of the influence it might have beyond academia. Uh, so it's a really nice way to provide a rounded view of research. So we provide a comprehensive article based suite of metrics on all the research that we publish so that you can see how it's being talked about in addition to where it's being cited by other researchers. As I mentioned at the start, what we're all about is supporting researchers at all stages of the, their careers and at all stages of the research process. So we provide a huge range of article options and these are all peer reviewed and all citable. And this is just some of them. There are others um, that we provide on, on the F1000 model. So I just wanted to focus on a couple. So method articles and software tool and data articles. They're becoming increasingly popular article choices for research authors. And so a method article, uh, and we have another type, which is much, a little bit clinical focused, which is your research, a research study protocol. You can publish those with us. So if you've designed a methodology or a study protocol, you can actually publish that in its own right and have that peer reviewed. And you can do that at the beginning of a research project, at the end after you've um, perhaps developed um, the whole research project, you can do that whenever. But it's actually a really important research output in its own right, and it, it often gets lost within a larger piece of research or isn't shared. So again, why would you do this? Well, obviously this is a great way for your methods to be shared, to support others to use those methodologies it's a great training option for others to, to pick up on your method and particularly improves the visibility of, of lots of methods experts who often don't get involved or they're not the lead author on a publication or massively important members of the research team. But it also provides a visibility a solution for them as well, which we're seeing an increased demand for. Similarly, for data and software articles. These are articles that dis describe the how and the why of a particular data set um, or materials underpinning a piece of research or a research program. Similarly to method articles, uh, they're a really good tool to support reproducibility. So you can present your data um, in its own right, say what it's for. Other people can, from different disciplines, might want to look at that data and think how it might be applicable to their area. Um, but it also is really key for others working in the field to see and perhaps scrutinize um, a data set that's been put together. Sometimes data sets in their own right uh, are all that comes out of a research project as well. Um, and we work with a number of medical charities in the UK, particularly who wanted to make sure that research data sets that have been collected as part of a project, even if the project didn't discover anything major, are still shared and not lost. So it speaks to the whole of avoiding research waste discussion as well. And again, and increasingly so, um, there are many people now working as part of research teams that are experts in, in data analysis, they're data scientists, they're research software developers, uh, and it allows a, a real nice route for them to have um, a focus on and a shine a light on the work that they do, particularly useful to support their careers as well. So what I've just talked about are the, the diversity of peer reviewed article types that we, we offer. Um, we also provide uh, options for researchers to share other kinds of research outputs. And this is a growing area for us. We're developing this all the time. These are things that aren't peer reviewed, but they're nonetheless important um, outputs of research. So many researchers produce things like technical guidelines, policy reports, training materials, even things like posters and slide decks, which you can share them in different places, 
but they often don't get uh, the visibility or discoverability that you'd ideally want. So what we do on our platforms, we allow people to share this kind of work. We give it an open access license. Uh, we give it a DOI. We have usage metrics associated with it, so you can also see, you know, views and downloads on a, on a there's an example on the on the left there, uh, which is a policy report about how to rethink journal impact factors. Um, and this is a, a longer document. It didn't need peer reviewing, uh, but it was nonetheless produced by a, a number of um, you know, people working in this space who wanted to share the work. And rather than just put it on a website somewhere, they wanted it to be seen as part of a publishing um, approach and package. And then again, to round, round that off, it also speaks to the, the issue that I mentioned at the beginning, that making sure that all outputs of research are valued and, and, and considered important outputs in their own right, um, where they should be. Um, but this is something that we're a signatory to the DORA Declaration, which is the Declaration on Research Assessment, which is a, a global movement to try to help uh, research assessment be uh, be viewed in a much more holistic and, and useful way for the future of research. So that's F1000 research. That's the approach that we have. That's what you can publish on our platform already. You can submit work here already. So I can you, you can see all the links there. I will send these links to you. So it's available for researchers now. But in addition, We've been working uh, with other organisations to, to kind of replicate this solution and provide different options and packages for institutions and for funding agencies uh, and other organisations. And there are three ways that organisations work with us. The first is we get author, we get uh, institutions buying bundles or sponsoring researchers to publish with us using the open access article processing charge uh, approach. And authors can just come to us and publish with us on the F1000 site, as I've shown you. But some organisations uh, sponsor and promote um, the, the publishing platform as, as, a, as a nice move uh, and step into supporting open research more generally. Second option, it's kind of a second step, step up, is a number of organisations also sponsor a space on our F1000 platform for their community directly. So we have uh, collections for uh, institutions. So we have one here with the bottom one is with University College London Institute of Child Health. So anything on our platform linked to any of their researchers, we build it, we've built a space for. Um, so if you look at that, it's kind of their own mini journal. And it's also got things like articles and it's got the non peer reviewed things like uh, documents, posters, slides, and it builds a hub for them of anything that's been published with us in their space. The, the one at the top is for the TDR, which is the Tropical Disease Research Institute. It's part of the World Health Organization. And again, they've been really keen on supporting uh, rapid publishing and sharing of research findings for, for many obvious reasons, especially in, in the recent, uh, recent year. Um, but they've always been a big advocate of open access and open publishing. And then the third kind of step up is we've been providing what we call publishing platforms as unique publishing solutions for organisations. So in this example, what we've effectively done is built a version of F1000 research for another organisation. So this is an example of one we've done for the Wellcome Trust. Um, so we are providing publishing services to a funder, providing the independent professional publishing services, but the funder is sponsoring uh, this is a place for their researchers uh, to have their own space to publish using the open publishing method. They didn't, they, researchers uh, that are Wellcome funding can publish on F1000 research in the first place, but Wellcome wanted to really promote it, brand it and build their own space uh, and do more with it because this is customizable also. I'm just going to show you a little bit more about that. So I won't show you obviously option one, researchers can publish with us. That's a really simple, that's available now. Option two is if you have your own gateway. So we we provide gateways here, There's some more examples. And as I mentioned, these become dedicated spaces for an organisation on the platform. Uh, and within these spaces, you can build themed areas. So uh, we have we have a couple of clients that have uh, 
themed areas within their gateway that's all about their strategic aims. So we have organisations doing things by region or by subject area. Here, F1000 remains the journal, so the citation of anything in your gateway is F1000 Research. Um, but we provide the publishing end-to-end -end solution, and again, APCs uh, and the publishing fees are either paid for by the author or by, by the client, and it varies. And I guess these are the more shiny, bigger, even, even bigger examples, is we provide platforms, as I mentioned, like the welcome example, uh, and these are much more customizable. They're effectively their own unique publishing venue with their own citation. So if you publish here on one of these, um, the citation would be to the publishing platform. So no longer is it F1000 research. The, the, the example here, you'd be cited. So if you published on the welcome platform, it would be your publication journal would be welcome open research. If you published on the Gates one, your publication journal would be Gates Open Research. So the brand of the funder is very much in the publishing. So it's a bit like a society journal. It's got the name or a university press. It has the name of the organization in that citation. And that's been a key, key driver for some of the partners that we work with to help take their researchers with them. You can do all kinds of because these are online platforms and and it's and it's easy to build space there's no space limitations in a way um, we can provide all kinds of dedicated spaces within these platforms for subjects or teams and this is an example of the welcome platform so these are kind of special issues or um, collections so obviously they've got um, a collection based on covid they've got lots of research going on uh, on covid at the moment so they've built a space for that work um, and there are other areas that are their strategic priorities so there's another one uh, around um, waiting and care times in health services in the uk uh, and beyond and then there's other ones on tuberculosis but this is completely customizable depending on the client. And we've also got platforms being used. What you can do again is create spaces on these platform sites, much more than you would do with the traditional journal. Um, and we have uh, platforms using them for uh, supporting, uh, putting a showcase on early career research of contributions. So on the welcome platform, we use advisory boards like editorial boards that help um, work out the eligibility for, for publishing on the platform and help bring in content. And on the welcome platform, we've set up an early career researcher advisory board. And we on the site also have got lots of options to shine a light on early career researcher work. So we have podcasts on there. We have blogs written by early career researchers that accompany the actual published material. So your pub, pub, it's a publishing outlet, but in addition, there's a blog and you can use infographics and lots of other, other um, multimedia uh, tools that sit alongside the published work. And then we've also run uh, competitions through the blogs and through the through the platforms as well. So we recently ran a, a photography competition for, with the Academy African Academy of Sciences Open Research Platform. Uh, so any researchers, early career researchers who had produced some great photos or, or images as part of their research project, we actually shined a light on just those and had a, had a photography competition, which was which was really really popular. And we're doing this really to encourage engagement and, and excitement in, in getting people to share and publish their work in many different ways. So just to summarize, why do organizations work with us? Go back to the reasons for open, open research, um, to accelerate the sharing and publishing of research, to reduce waste and to support reproducibility. Uh, these vary, but again, we get lots of organisations working with us to be able to support researchers across the career stages and ac across the career um, roles. So supporting early career researchers, but also supporting different types of team members. So methodologists, software developers. Um, it's a really great way to allow all members of the teams to be able to share their work. And then we get some organisations who really just want to also develop a tailored open access solution for themselves to really take hold of the publishing process themselves um, and get more involved in making sure that all the research that they funded is, is published. 
which obviously supports the shift to more open knowledge, open science practices. So just before I finish, I just wanted to show you some real data on what's been happening on the platforms. So we've done all this work, we've got all these nice clients and we, we're working, we have lots of partnerships and lots of exciting things in the pipeline. Um, but do researchers like it? So this is the data from the Welcome platform. So this is the Welcome Open Research platform. This is powered by F1000. So we provide the publishing services behind it. On this platform, you can publish your original research um, and, and other things. And after four years, this is now the number one destination for all Welcome funded authors. So Welcome Publish, and, and in my previous role, uh, I used to do a lot of a lot of work looking at where Welcome funded research is published, and there are at least five and a half to six thousand papers linked to Welcome funding every year. So there is a lot of work coming out of Welcome funded research. They are a big funder, but this has become the number one. So of all the publishing journals in the world, this is now the number in terms of the volume of publishing. This is this has become the destination number one, which we're really proud of. There are nearly 900 papers on this site already in less than four years or well, four years. So it's becoming really popular. And one of the exciting things for us is that we're seeing nearly half of the papers on this site are non traditional research uh, articles, so peer reviewed articles. But they're the kinds that I showed you earlier. So method articles, study protocols, data articles. So there's a real demand from researchers to publish those kinds of works that actually were hard to share or were often embedded in a larger article previously as well. Bill and Melinda Gates platform uh, that, that was launched a year later. That's number two as a destination for Gates authors, but we're still really excited about that. Um, they have a slightly different focus in terms of what they publish. They, they Gates, a Gates Foundation also uh, support a lot of applied research and health services research. Um, and we've seen a real demand for the non peer reviewed content types on this platform also. Um, so you can see on, on at the top there, we've got a lot of non traditional outputs like documents, policy documents that aren't peer reviewed. Uh, and we see a huge amount of um, views and, and interaction with that kind of material, which has been really exciting. In addition to the research articles, which are peer reviewed. And then really excitingly, we have launched last month uh, a platform for the European, European Commission. And uh, this is called Open Research Europe and the links are all on that site. This is across all disciplinary areas, so it's supporting grant beneficiaries from all the Horizon 2020 grant um, funding program, and also they will be it will be supporting the Horizon Europe um, program as, as Simon mentioned, which when it comes online next month, I think it's June when it starts officially. So just to summarize quickly. Um, F1000, what we try to do for research institutions and funders, we help them uh, become at the fore of open science. If you work with us, we can support you in, in providing publishing solutions that not only support you with research articles that are peer reviewed, but also uh, beyond that. Uh, helps to maximize visibility and discoverability of all your research outputs. We can really help, we think, uh, working with organisations to put a showcase on on those research outputs and from researchers across career stages. Through the efficiency and uh, reducing of research waste, we can help support research strategy and efficiency for organisations. And we're a simple, immediate, open access, compliant publishing option also. And for researchers, one of the key the key drivers that we hear from researchers is they want to get things out quickly. So we provide and rapid routes. Uh, we also extend the ability for them to share and get reach for their work. So citable content, which is really important for researchers and, and their profiles and their careers. Uh, as I mentioned, it's attractive, particularly to early career researchers, but, but researchers across career stages and role types. Um, using gateways and platforms, you can really start to showcase different departments and faculties and subject areas. Uh, makes work really transparent, so it encourages uh, collaboration and the ability to see who's doing what within your institution. But it also encourages international collaborations because people can see and shine, be able to see who's doing what at your institution because it's 
all open on that platform for everyone to see. And it's very forward facing. And that's what we're hearing from many researchers now is that people want to experiment and step outside of traditional publishing models. And this is something that we're providing an option for researchers to do. So that's the conclusion. Um, I, I'm really happy to answer any questions. I hope I've given you lots of food for thought. Um, I expect there's lots of information there that um, for you to digest at another point. As I mentioned, you can have these slides. I'll, I'll happily share them um, and I'm happy to take any questions and uh, yeah, and you can contact me at any point also. So thank you very much again for inviting me. I hope that was useful and um, yeah, look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Liz. Uh, very interesting indeed. Um, it's an exciting initiative and I think there should be lots of questions. Uh, what amazes me when I hear you, and this is not the first time I've heard you present, but the progress that F1000 has made in a relatively short time and the number of different groups that, 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 uh, that you're working with. Um, before we move to, to the questions and answers, I just wanna make a couple of introductions. Uh, when we began the webinar, um, my colleague who's helping moderate the session uh, was just connecting so I'd like to introduce her to you. Um, her name is Ajan uh, Subapan Serafin, and maybe she could uh, wave to, 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 to us. <laughs> from, so she, um, she is a senior advisor here at NASDA, uh, at NSTDA, the National Science and Technology Development Agency in Thailand. She's also a senior advisor to uh, King Mongkut University of Technology, Tonbury. Uh, KMUTT uh, here in Bangkok as well. So uh, she will be moderating this Q&A session um, with me. I'd also like to introduce uh, Barry Clark. Um, Barry is, is uh, Managing Director of Taylor & Francis Asia Pacific. And I think Liz earlier in her presentation mentioned that, that uh, F1000 uh, joined the Taylor & Francis group uh, some time ago. Barry, could you just uh, give us a wave there? And uh, uh, happy so, new year. <laughs> so, so it's interesting because I think Taylor and Francis is one of the is probably well known to you many to many of you, one of the older publishing houses out there, and and it's teamed up with what what obviously is a is, is a very new initiative. So the the old and the and the new are coming together. Um, so just two introductions for you. So let's let's move to questions. There there are many that have come in. Um, the first question, Liz, that came up, and you, it, it's come up in a couple of slides. You say publish fast uh, and without openly and without restrictions. What is meant by without restrictions? That's one of our participants asking that. Liz? Oh, so, sorry. Yeah. I, yes. Yeah. Yes, that's a very good question. I think. What we mean by that is we don't editorially screen out content at the beginning. So when something is submitted to us, we don't decide if it's, um, you know, if it's a null or negative finding or incremental. We don't screen anything out for potential impact. What we're looking for is that it's scholarly work, that it's kind of sound science, um, that it's something from researchers with a, a scholarly affiliation, etc. What we don't do is put any barriers in place by saying it's not exciting or it's, um, you know, it's, it has to be a positive finding. We don't cherry pick what we publish. So we, we, we remove those kind of barriers. So if researchers want to share their findings of a research project that it meets our pre-publication checks, they absolutely can. Okay. Uh, another couple of questions here is which is often the case with any with any with any service what does it cost so let's start with an individual researcher you mentioned that that that, that basically any individual researcher can can engage with f1000 uh how does the the the, the business model work who pays when and to whom very good question um obviously the key question um, so if anything publishes on F1, anything published on the basic F1000 platform, we have an, it's an open access using article processing charges model. So unless we have an agreement with an organization um, to pay for you, 
uh, the articles will be the APC will be author facing. Mm -hmm. And as part of the model, again, we have a tiered APC model for depending on the article type that you submit to us. So we have a huge, as I mentioned, we have a, a wide range of article types. So a data note. So if you're talking about your data and it's and, it, and it's brief and it's really focused on the data, those are our cheapest article types and they are 800 US dollars each. If you publish uh, uh, some other types of articles that are a bit more complicated, they take a bit longer for us to get them peer reviewed. Um, we charge a thousand dollars US dollars and then for the bigger articles um, which tend to be when I say bigger it doesn't it's not about word count it's about complexity um, they are the research articles sometimes the methods pieces um, those are 1350 US dollars so that's the most we charge we are very competitive on the open access market but I appreciate um, they are still um, you know costs to be paid by the authors um, but it is tiered based upon the article type mm. the maximum you'll pay is 1350 us dollars 1350 us dollars and the cheapest ones are 800 dollars mm. but we also offer waivers and discounts depending on where authors are in the world so we follow the research for life um, criteria for um, the hinari waivers for authors um, who who have who are based in countries that apply for that also but actually so so that's 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 for publishing on the f1000 platform oh. if you publish on a, one of our platforms that's linked to a funder or a, a um and you have to be linked to those funders somehow to publish on them we have a diamond model with that funder that they will pay for everything so that the author fees get taken away from the author so we have various agreements with with the platform clients for what 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 the agreement is but yeah so there's two kind of two ways of of, of being able to publish with us and different costs so because yeah, why with you know we've mentioned this horizon europe program which is which is launching now um which is you know one of the largest research and innovation funding programs in the world and, and, and thai researchers have been very active in the previous programs uh horizon 2020 and fp7 and so on so as I understand it, that a researcher, if they're going to participate in, in, in a Horizon Europe-funded project, they have to go the open access route, correct? Yes, they, yes. So they have, they would have to go open access. Um, what, what we haven't got with any of our funding platforms, and I think I didn't say this, it is not mandated. None of the funders say you must publish here. So they yeah. let authors choose where they publish. Right. It's just that the publishing platforms are a nice, simple, quick option yeah. for researchers. Right. And if you want to have all the features that I described, you can publish. But the European Commission do not mandate researchers to publish on Open Research Europe, but they've introduced it as a nice option what for option? them. Right. And yeah, right. and, and right. it's got a, yeah. Yeah. The, the author fees are taken away from the author. Yeah, I think that's, that's the point I wanted to get to, that I think it's, you know, that if you're in one of these projects, those come out of your research funding from the commission yes. or uh, they cover those, yes. those charges. Yeah. Um, and then a related point, not, not for you, Liz, but maybe, maybe Ajahn Supapan can help answer. Yes. And I suspect this was going to come up. Um, are there support or waivers for Thai researchers in terms of the APC? So I'm just wondering what, what maybe the policy would be at KBTT, for example. Um, How does a researcher cover their APC? Um, uh, that particular question, I cannot answer you, Simon, at the moment. Mm. But um, I would like to follow up with uh, Liz. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. This is very exciting and certainly um, for my former career of publishing, I wish I have choices like this, um, but unfortunately not. Now, um, moving on to this uh, wonderful um, option. Now, let's imagine that um, I'm an upstart coming faculty member, and um, I still be judged for my promotion and tenure based on, you know, it's a bit, um, but I think we are in the transition right now. I'll be asked 
to justify my paper that I publish with um, impact factor with tier one, tier two, or Q1, Q2 kind of uh, status. So how could you please just put this F1000 into this kind of context as a for young faculty or mid-career researcher, please? Yes, yeah, thank you. Thank you. That's probably the most important question. Um, and we get asked that all the time. So um, an F1000 article does, it, it's indexed, it's totally citable. What we don't have is a journal impact factor because we, we initially didn't want to join that, um, you know, the, the, the kind of challenge of, of, of having things judged by the journal impact factor of the journal rather than the article. So it, if the university uh, committees, you know, rec recognize things that are indexed in Scopus and in uh, other indexes, then an F1000 paper absolutely counts. Um, but at the moment, we we don't have a journal impact factor, so it's it's not we don't have that on any of our platforms. It's basically article based metrics. So it's it's a perfectly citable, um, recognized publication. It just isn't part of a journal that has a journal impact factor. Uh, I appreciate that is a challenge if the country has has a requirement that it has to be in uh, has a, in a journal that has a journal impact factor. But actually, we have other client other uh, um, many countries also use the Scopus quartiles as citation quartiles, and we perform pretty well in some of those as well. So we are actually in those as well as do the as do the platforms. Um, but yeah, and I suppose the other side of this is. This does allow a lot of researchers who wouldn't have been able to publish in at all uh, options to publish their methods and shine a light on other things. So we're kind of hoping that gradually the fact that researchers are doing this kind of work, sharing their work in new ways and taking advantage of all the opportunities that are now available, that we're hoping that the policymakers will kind of recognise that and, and develop their thinking, which, which again is what the DORA declaration work is about. It's all about rethinking research evaluation. And I, I mentioned that on one of my slides at the beginning, new ways of, of thinking about research assessment are coming on board all the time. Um, yeah, it, it just, it's just a case of how and on when to move move that. But I totally appreciate that you know you don't want to take a risk with your research career um, if you don't have to. So I'm not but sure I've answered that in full. Yes, you you did, um, and certainly we have to, as you mentioned, the promotion and tenure system, which I think in the US uh, they a uh, few steps ahead. Um, as compared to in Thailand, which they just uh, put this system of quartai and scopus and all this not too long ago, but I don't know how long it could take them to open up and um, exist because I agree with you. Impact factor is more like a, a sales strategy or sell yeah. pitch for the journal rather than the article itself, but somehow everybody play along and, and thing like that. So I'm, I'm excited and, and thank you for um, taking this initiative to open up the, the different way of get the, our research published. Now, I want to move to the next question about if the reviewers, if I understand you correctly, the reviewers are pretty much open um, on the platform and um, the review not like uh, in the anonymous peer review system. But then you assume that uh, everyone take the conflict of interest in a gentleman manner or how, how, what is the thinking behind this, which I think it could be very productive and wonderful. However, um, since I played a game before, so I'm not sure <laughs> that it's, it will be a fair and, you know, get over this um, conflict of interest or, or yeah, chat, chat with us. 
the logic and the thinking behind this? Please. Yes, that, that is also a really excellent question. And I think lots of debate around this. Um, so, yeah, the, the, we do screen for conflicts of interest like any other publisher does, but they do it behind behind a, a, a wall so you can't see what they've what they've done. Obviously, the, all, the reviewers have to say if they've got any conflicts of interest, but we also have a, a set of criteria. So you can't, uh, you know, if you've published with someone recently or, you know, if you if you work with them we, we, or if you're married to them or whatever, we do screen out those things already as well. So we do try really hard to screen out conflicts of interest, but because it's open and transparent, um, if there was a conflict of interest, it's very, very obvious and it can be called out um, and there is an option on the site to comment um, and you can send an email to, to F1000 as well and we would check that out if we'd missed something. Um, but also, um, so that's another side of it. So we do have a validation check there in terms of, you know, it's open and transparent um, and we do argue that actually there's still lots of conflicts of interest in the closed peer review system. It's just that you can't see it and there's no data on that. Whereas in our system, we've kind of laid it all to bear and you can see it all. Um, but what we are seeing, so what I'm saying is I'm not sure either model is perfect. Um, I think what we're trying to do is, uh, you know, encourage transparency and be part of the open science collaborative way of doing peer review. Um, and we're hoping over time that our peer review model, it's all about helping researchers get their work into the best shape it can be, rather than saying, no, you can't publish it. And, and, and there's a lot of bad behavior around that side of it, not always, but um, so that's what our, our model is. Peer review is about constructive uh, feedback um, and making that work as, as helpful as possible. Um, and we're seeing that most of the, the people that review for us are, are pretty constructive. Our editors do look at what they say as well, just in case they say, um, you know, things that are derogatory or, or unhelpful. And we do check the comments that they make before they're posted. Um, but yeah, the whole point of our model is that it's constructive and maybe one size for the future does not fit all. Um, but I, I think as part of our model, it's kind of a core thing that we wanted to have the ability for, you know, researchers, researchers as authors to share their work, share every aspect of it and then get constructive feedback on that. But also for a reader to have the ability to read what somebody said about their work um, before they look at it. Uh, we'd, and on the other side of it, what we're seeing a number of organisations say is that actually using our platform as a training platform for peer reviewers, because it's you can see what kinds of reviews come through and you can see this one's great. This one might have had a bit more information in it, et cetera, et cetera. So really seeing um, people embrace the, 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 the way that you you can see other people's reviews and learn how to build on that. So we're also seeing it as a as a way of doing that. And that's one of the things the welcome platform are looking at having the early career advisory board. So they are having prizes for the best review and the best um, article as well, but but the best review as well, because they're trying to encourage early career researchers to review constructively and, and, and in the best way. And, and honestly, obviously, but yes, but some people don't review for us because it's open uh, and I'm being completely <laughs> honest on, on that. Yeah. yeah, I can imagine Lo that. Lots of things. <laughs> so now, um, again, I'm I'm very familiar with um, the US, but not quite in European uh, platform or setting. So your rivalry is the Scientific American, which is American Chemical Society, or um, Nature or which publishers that um, you either uh, together, I believe you work with and you come up with better product or, or be better or more attractive options for researchers. Can, can you name a few of those publishers or journals? Sorry, I'm not sure what, what, what the question is. You mean which which other publishers are, are adopting aspects of the peer review model? Or? No, no, of the open access or the F1000. Sorry. 
sorry, I'm not sure what the question okay. is. Okay, go back to sorry. if I would be a mid-career or a really yes. productive researcher at the moment yes. and um, if I will, because this is very wonderful for me, if my promotion and tenure does not necessarily up to the impact factor only, um, but I can uh, rely on if I'm sure that my work is so good there will be a lot of citation as an example, right? And yeah. this will be, I believe that uh, it will reflect on my age index as an example. My question is, if I look into F1000, then where else should I look to compare whether they will do as good as your, your platform? Yeah, I suppose in terms of the, in terms of the sort of profile of F one thousand as a as a journal, uh, in terms of its competitors, uh, I think we'd say that our competitors are probably the PLOS journals, uh, PLOS One, um, Public Library of Science journals, um, and and maybe eLife and uh, some of the more forward thinking models with PeerJ, um, those kinds of uh, competitors, because because they're they're very much, we find a lot of the authors that publish with us will also have published in those places too, because they're all op about open access and all about open, uh, and then most of them are bringing on kind of services uh, for open science more generally. Um, and I'm sure obviously um, there's room for lots of different options out there. I think, you know, if you had, if you had really, really totally groundbreaking uh, science, we would love you to publish with F1000, but you might, you might be able to get it in a in a in a in a in a very high prestige journal. I'm not using the word impact factor there, but you know what I mean. Um, so okay. researchers have a choice. Um, but what we're saying is there's there's many options here. Um, we we do get a lot of really important uh, work with us and across our publishing partner platforms. Um, but there's an option there for different types of of, of publishing solutions as well as uh, and different outputs that you can publish with us. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I will move on to Simon, please. If you have other questions. Well, I, I think, I mean, one question I have really, maybe it's a follow on to, to your, to your question and also to your answer, Liz. So, you know, if I'm a young researcher, uh, you know, you, you mentioned early on in your presentation, the number of open access initiatives that are out there. How, how do I choose as a young researcher? And, you know, in other words, you know, what are the advantages that F1000 is offering to researchers that maybe is, are not available in some of the other, um, the other initiatives? So, you know, you know in, in, as you say, in Horizon Europe, you're not, F1000 is offered as, as a platform, not the only platform you can, you can publish on. So why would you choose F1000 versus another platform? That's my, my question. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we, we do surveys with researchers about why they've published with mm. us and we get feedback mm. surveys. Um, I think one of the key things that they like about us is the diversity of article options. So we get a lot of people who like the fact that we can publish, you know, your methods or data in addition to research articles. So we we have a unique uh, sort of point around the article options that we provide. And people also like the fact that they article processing fee is tailored according to that. So that's that's interesting. Um, rapid rapidity. So we get a lot of a lot of people coming to us because they like the idea of it being get it out um, and get it through the peer review process. And, and whilst the peer review process is being done, it's still published on Google Scholar and it's there. Uh, and you can see it in real time. So a lot of people are excited to see how they publish their research and it's being peer reviewed all in a kind of opened on the publishing process basically and allowed you to kind of see what's going on throughout the process. A lot of people really like that. Um, and at the difference between us and a preprint server, so again, I showed at the beginning, there are lots of preprint kind of servers out there for researchers to get work out if they want to just get it out quickly without the peer review. But then you'd go to a journal probably, yeah. And what we've done is brought the whole lot together, which again, takes out an extra step for researchers. So again, it, it ties it all together. So there's kind of a nice, for me, it's, um, you know, one of the big pain points for researchers is about 
submission systems on publishing platforms and it, different journals have different things and uh, and that is changing i think gradually publishers are starting to sort of see synergies about um you know connecting in metadata and i mentioned that that's definitely a trend is interoperable metadata so you don't keep having to introduce all your information each time you put it into wherever you go um but yeah that's a real pain point so we do find that publish with us and you can get through the whole process and it's all in one place that's the benefit as well so those are probably the three key ones article diversity of of, of choice speed and one-stop shop thank you liz uh, i have another question here this is from one of our participants um this is let me just go back to the question. So I think we, we discussed this a while ago uh, in another meeting. Um, do you, how do you deal with different languages? Can you, can you publish the articles in Thai or Vietnamese, for example? Can they be submitted for, for, for review? Um, how would F1000, does F1000 accept that? And if so, how do you deal with the language, different languages? Yeah, really, really important question. Um, unfortunately, we are only publishing in English at the moment. Um, we are looking at this um, because obviously it's an obvious thing that we should be supporting, especially um, we're all about discoverability, right? So we should be looking at that. We do have one gateway in Japanese, so you can publish in Japanese. And when I say publish, the whole process is in Japanese. So the submission system, the form is in Japanese, the for, the the, uh, um, and this was a pilot. Everything about the publishing process is in Japanese. Um, so, if there's any any Japanese um, speakers who want to publish in Japanese on on the mm. call, we can do that, but only through the Scuba University Gateway at the moment. Um, and that was an experiment for us, and a, and, a, and a, um, yeah. something we're looking at. What we can do more easily, and I know a number of publishers are doing this. We aren't doing this right now, um, but we can. What you can do is maybe have an abstract that is in dual languages as well. So, we, so there's, there's a difference between supporting the whole process in a language and allowing you to provide either a translated version or a um, abstract in dual language as well. Um, so we are looking at that. That is probably coming quicker than the whole publishing process in another language at the moment. I don't know if that answers. It's a really good this question you ever asked that. And <laughs> yeah. And Talking about different language, um, I wonder roughly how, what is the percentage of Chinese researchers published in F1000? That's a good question. I, I'm not yeah. sure. We do have. Uh, uh, let, let me Chinese rephrase word. it. Uh, yeah, let me rephrase it. Um, is F1000 moderately or well accepted in China or among Chinese researchers? Good, uh, that's a good question that way around too. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Since you we mentioned do have... about Japanese, yeah, you know, yeah, so yeah. I'm just curious because Chinese, they publish right crazy. Yeah, we've just launched two uh, platforms in China. So we've launched two with a technology um, university of the University of Beihan. Um, one's about uh, robotics and another one is uh, a dig it's called Digital Twin. It's um, uh, we're building we're building this platform for them. We've just announced it. I can send you the link um, links through. But yeah, but that will all be done in English. Even mm. though it's a China understand. I think that makes sense to me. Yeah. That makes sense to me because if they publish in Chinese, then that limit their impact. And that's um, what they wanted to do. They wanted to have international reach with the work. So even exactly. though it's linked to that yeah, makes sense. So, yeah. Yeah. Now can but going I, can forward. Move? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Go. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, no. I talk too much. <laughs> no, I would like to hear that going forward because I'm about to going forward to the organization oh, okay. <laughs> like um, NASDA. Like um, now, I can okay. Promise you don't forget your thought, okay? And I will finish my question first, and then you can go back there. This is a great conversation. Um, so your example of Melinda Gate Foundation, Welcome Foundation, those are huge 
um, and they're rich. They have tons and tons of money. They have extensive um, researchers. But to bring back to home, like NASDA, will well if we have if NASA has a lot of money, I say go for it. Let's invest and let's buy some spares and let's work with you. Let's collaborate with F1000 so that our researcher can da 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 and you, you can I mean um I I buy your stuff, okay? I buy your thought and I love it. So how do you compare? in that uh, both stage of that. So go, go back to, come back to, I, I think Barry has um, shared with us and tried to explain and convince us and so on and so forth, but it, it, the whole thing will not be up to Suparpan and Simon here, right? We have to, <laughs> we have to go and, and sell it to the, um, um, the executive and um, the the budget and all that. Yeah. So let's move our discussion. But you finish your thought then first, please. Please. Yeah. I mean, we we we're evolving the model all the time and the options for partners all the time. I'm sure we could find a way to work with NASDAQ in a in a way that would mutually be mutually um, you know uh, uh, helpful for us. Right. We'd love to work with you and in, in, in the region, but we'd also love to make sure that whatever we did suited your needs because we wouldn't want to do anything that you know kind of undermined the potential we want to sort of see it as a forward solution so i think we presented some ideas previously but we'd certainly be able to have another conversation about what 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 and what we could do because yeah you're right um you might not have the tons and tons of money i use your phrase that gates and welcome have but you have a massive influence and lots of researchers working in really exciting spaces uh, yourselves so i'm sure there's something we could we could do to help that and 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 even experiment with that right with you um that so that's so that would be definitely a conversation we'd have be happy to have um and you know what i've forgotten my thought now <laughs> so i can't Oh, I know. I remembered. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I wrote it down. Um, um, I'm getting old. Um, yeah. The, yeah. What we're looking at with the China, the China platforms, that was the thing. Looking forward, we are looking at whether there are certain parts of the platform that we could provide in in the in the regional national language. So whether there's some instructions, even if the publishing process remains in English for the near future. Um, there could be more instructions that are that are more regionally based because it's quite complicated. We want to make sure that we, you know, we support um, the process in other languages too. So I think I think watch this space for the other languages work. Um, we're not there yet, but I know it's a it's a direction of travel for for many publishers, including us. That's important because if Japanese and Chinese, maybe next one in this region is Korea. And then it will be Thailand. Yeah. Yeah, that's good to, to finish <laughs> that thought. Yes. Yes. And if I may just chime in, having lived in Singapore for 30 years and still not being able to speak more than a few words in Korean or Thai or, or Malay, I'm very or Chinese. A, a little more in Chinese. I confess uh. I used to be um, a little bit more conversant in Mandarin, but um, the point is, it is very important that we sort of decolonize uh, knowledge in this way and uh, allow the voices of, of this region in particular to be heard. Um, it is a challenge um, and you know, the language of, of science in particular is, is English, but they, we know that there's a lot of conversations in many other languages that need to be captured. And one of the things that I'm so excited about this, about this solution is that it does give a chance for those voices to be heard almost on an equal footing. And one thought that occurs to me, I mean, NSTDA, if we can work together, would just be the perfect partner to experiment, perhaps not maybe the whole workflow in Thai, but there's certainly maybe elements of the workflow to make it more accessible to Thai researchers. So there could be other benefits to the Thai community beyond the investment in, in, in just the platform. Um, and the other point I was going to make, if I may, um, yes, I mean, there is a cost to research. There is a cost to getting published. 
what we think with this kind of open access publishing and the F1000 solution is that it's making the, the affordability of, of publishing within reach, but also I think it's more equitable. I, I think whilst, yes, I do work for Taylor & Francis, one of the big publishers um, with, with, with paywalls in, in many respects to our content, we are sincerely looking for ways to break those paywalls down. And I think whilst we must recognize that there still must be a fund available for publishing because it takes money to get material published on, on, a, on a platform and all the linking and the um, coordination and the hosting, there is a cost there. I do sincerely think that this is a much more equitable way of making research available. Um, so I just thought I'd chime in there with my thoughts. Which, uh, thank you. Which actually, the price that you were just um, gave it to us a few numbers there, it's about the, the cost that I would uh, publish 20 years ago. So I would echo that it's competitive. Um, but all the benefits that you already share with us, that sound great. However, I would, as I said, um, the, the hurdle or the hardest thing is to convince mid-career or early career researcher to get outside the box because yes. they, they still are evaluated in their career path based on the old measure. So it, it will take a lot to for them to step out and be convinced. So as you, I, I know you know that, but I yes. just sum it up. Yeah. Yes. And again, I'm engaged in conversations in, in Indonesia and in Singapore and in Malaysia and the Philippines um, on the, the, the progression of, of publishing and open research. And there is still an obsession with impact factor. Liz quite rightly um, discussed this earlier. Um, impact factor um, is a bit of an obsession. That's the only word I can use for it. But I detect a sincere feeling amongst funders, amongst institutions, researchers, that really we need to move beyond impact factor. I'm not saying it will go away today or tomorrow, and there's still a role to play for measuring impact, but the obsession with impact, I think, is holding back um, a lot of uh, research and the availability of research. So I, I do think F1000 is at the cutting edge of, of a long-term solution to this problem. And hopefully funders and institutions, administrations at universities are beginning to see the light and are beginning to realize that there's other ways to measure impact. I, I think that's that's partly of the strategy of why we partner with such big funding names. And it, uh, again, if you if the funder says to the research community, actually, it's OK to publish in different ways and come with us, then researchers follow, which is what we've seen with Gates and Welcome. I know they're big names, but the EC is the same. And when you've got leaders like that doing it, it makes it less scary for another funder in a, in a region that's perhaps not doing this already to step into that space also and gradually, especially if researchers, I mean, I mean, you hinted at this before that, you know, some of the researchers, you know, in Thailand uh, have access to Horizon or working as part of the Horizon Europe or Horizon 2020 grants already. They'll be much more familiar with that anyway. They could probably, you know, um, be very familiar with the model. So I think the more that the more that the funders kind of support the move uh, you know that it's okay to share your research and we want you to share everything and and, and get it out there and get it used uh, we think that'll be the 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 catalyst to you know for institutions to start and, and whoever's making the evaluation decisions because it's it's all of us really right we need to move together to say um yeah let's let's try and do things a bit differently um yeah but we hope that's the funded the funder partnerships is, are intended to help that move great point yes i agree Maybe I could just just um, come back to the to the language issue. This is a question from one of our participants, um, and I think I know the answer. But the, this, they're asking whether, for example, research in language teaching, which is sort of you know 
both art and science, would that be considered for review? So I think the question there is, you know, does F1000 cover all research areas or, or is it uh, focused on a select few? No, we can cover all research areas. So we started out in 2013 from a life science and medical health perspective. And then over the last five years, we've we've changed that dramatically. Um, and the platforms we're providing for the European Commission, for example, is cross-discipline. So it's everything from humanities, education, social sciences, uh, science and technology, every, everything. Um, just to add, we haven't... For people who might might be interested, we do the stuff that is non peer reviewed, so not the articles, so the things like technical reports or guidelines, we have published those in non English languages. And we can do that because they're at the moment coming in as PDFs, so we have them in version, so we can publish those in other languages. We do have to do some checks on them, so it does pose an extra challenge for us. If we can't speak Thai, for example, and we haven't got access to Thai editors to check them, um, but the metadata to support their discoverability does need to still be in English. So it would need to be submitted with author details in English and abstract in English because we index them on Google Scholar. Um, but the actual document itself, we've got quite a few examples, particularly in French, actually. Um, so there could be something there, but at the moment, um, it's yeah all research articles in English, unless you're part of the Japanese scuba gateway. <laughs> May I ask another question? Um, you know, we're talking about impact factor, et cetera. So the question here is, will the sort of, <clears throat> how are the F1000 sort of metrics linked to things like Scopus, PubMed, et cetera? Uh, so we are indexed in, in so F1000 itself is indexed in PubMed, Scopus, DOAJ already. So anything that passes peer review is indexed there. So it's all in there already. So you get, we get citation metrics from both or all those indexes um, and we track those. Um, our platforms, uh, similarly, uh, as, as people who may know, when you start, they're effectively starting a new journal. So when you start a new journal, you need an indexing strategy and you have to apply to be indexed. Uh, and we, as soon as we set up a new platform, we sort out how we apply, start applying for where, where you get indexed. Um, and most of our platforms uh, pretty quickly have also been indexed. So Welcome is its own journal and is also indexed in PubMed, Scopus, DOAJ, as is the African Academy of Sciences platform, as is the Gates platform. So they're all unique publishing outlets that are indexed in their own right and have their own citation data accordingly. I have one uh, question here that, um, again, if we understand the process of reviewing manuscript uh, correctly, how about if you reject that manuscript at the end, um, but the world already seen or saw the review, the everything, or do you mean that part of the review will, once you start the review, you will not reject that manuscript? How does it work in that detail? Yeah, really good question. So that's about the process. So um, effectively, if an article does not reach the past peer review and the reviewers are not happy with it, um, it will not be sent off for indexing in Scopus, PubMed, etc. But it will still be on the site and it will be available for people to look at as like a preprint would in a, in the previous in the previous work. Uh -huh. So, so it would stay so available the world, with the, the world comments. You see, uh, my yes. data still in your database, but not publish. Okay, makes it sense. Will not, it will not be indexed more broadly. Yes, but okay. but actually, we get we get quite a few people who are in that situation where their work has been kind of not passed peer review by the, by the reviewers, and they say, "Oh well, can we see if we can get another." view reviewer of this so sometimes they ask for another reviewer because sometimes reviewers disagree quite a lot um so they can do that um and and it just 
kind of works through if 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 they still don't get it approved it sits there or if they can get it approved it will go into indexing so yeah great great but you Thank only you. pay the apc once just that's just to mention that's another thing we get asked even if you submit other versions you only pay once you don't pay every time you submit a version it's just just once oh well that interesting because so I pay the APC to get the whole process going. So if I reject it, um, I don't get yeah, that money that back. Is, that is, <laughs> no, that is, that is the one thing that um, we do get a lot of feedback around. Um, but yes, you, it, you don't pay if you get rejected at the pre-pubs. So we'll check it to start with. You don't pay then. You only pay if you're on the platform, and then we've triggered all the peer. Review. So you're effectively paying for the peer review and the the whole process. Um, but it doesn't guarantee. There is no guarantee that you will be indexed. Most things get there in the end, but not everything. That's interesting because that's one of the difference. Because in the old days, we pay the publication page only when we get published. Yes. Ah, okay. But now, I think I know there's the a different answer. I was just going to say the there is a different word, model. Yeah, the review word will not get anything from you, right? No, we don't pay reviewers. Well, they, what they do get for us is they get visibility for actually reviewing sure. for us, and we sure. collect their orchid. I, we collect their orchid IDs, and we push that to orchid, so they get visibility for having taken part in supporting. Uh, the review of a work so they get much more visibility and we work with publons as well I don't know if you're familiar with publons but yeah we, we try to give the reviewers as much visibility as we can and we also encourage uh, co-reviewers so sometimes um, when someone's invited to review they often get somebody perhaps more more junior or one of their colleagues to help them and in the past those people don't get any visibility. We also ask, invite them to be named on the site as well. So sometimes early career researchers work with a senior researcher to review an article and we encourage both of them or, or all of them to be named. Do you have a system to kind of chat up the bad reviewers? Because they don't come <laughs> they're not all the same. Yeah. Right? Yeah, there no, absolutely. Who, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Because there are people who are so full of <laughs> ego and just show off <laughs> rather than doing the real work or the important to benefit the researchers. You know what I mean, right? <laughs> Yes, I do. Yes, we do. We, I mean, we do have a team that manages the peer review process and I, I, I actually <laughs> okay. don't know what systems they got, but I'm assuming they do the same thing. <laughs> okay, okay. All right, um, Simon, would you like to um, sum it up and give the closing remark for us, please? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jan Superfan. Um, yeah, I, unfortunately, I think we have to draw this conversation to, to a close. I don't like to be the bearer of uh, <laughs> bad news, but um, we, we have reached the, the end of the session. Uh, I would like to thank um, Liz Allen and, and Barry Clark, both of you for taking the time today to, to sort of explain F1000 and, and, and the benefits. It's obviously a, a very exciting initiative and you seem to be at the forefront of the, open, the whole sort of open research, open access uh, movement. Um, I wanted to say again that, that, that Liz, you know, you'd kindly uh, offer to field questions after this, this session and that you'll provide your your email address. I think it's at the end of the presentation. So that's a very generous, a generous offer. Uh, thank you for that. And in closing, just to say, we look forward. We hope this is not our last discussion. We look forward to further discussions with with F one thousand and with uh, with Taylor and Francis. So so thank you both very much. Uh, and before thank we you. before we close, thank you. Uh, let me just that you'll be. I think you're receiving. Please help me out here. You'll be receiving a feedback form. Uh, the participants will, so please, please fill that in. We do actually pay close attention to them um, and, and, and take your comments seriously so that we can continuously improve on, our, on these sorts of information sessions, which are an ongoing uh, activity of ours at, at NASDA. So, so please spend a little bit of time, won't take you long, just to complete the feedback form and, and uh, help us out. Uh, in our planning for future events. 
So thank you all very much. Thank you participants for, for spending the afternoon with us. And thanks again, Liz and Barry. So good afternoon, everyone. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.